Welcome back, students. Another day, another lecture about electronic spectroscopy. So today we are going to look into the inner workings of fluorescence, phosphorescence, and a couple of other techniques that rely on these, especially on fluorescence. Um, so we looked into these different techniques last time and saw the differences between them. We'll start by recapping what we discussed last time, and then we'll move into the inner workings of these techniques. So the learning goals for today are going to be to, uh, just like last time, to construct an energy diagram with all of the ways molecules can gain and lose energy when they're excited electronically. So you're going to want to get comfortable with that diagram. I'll show it here on the next slide. This is the last slide from last lecture. And then you're also going to want to be able to summarize the workings of these techniques that we're talking about. So what is fluorescence? What is phosphorescence? And how can we actually apply these? And then in the next lecture, we'll look at applying these to some biomolecule systems as well. So we ended here last time, and this was our chart of what happens when we excite molecules. So molecules are start in the ground state. Typically, this is a singlet state, and then in the ground electronic and vibrational state. And when we excite them, they go from the ground state to an excited state, and they have to obey the delta S equals zero rule. So since most molecules start in the singlet state, they go to the singlet state when they're excited. We saw last time the Frank Condon principle that talks about which vibrational modes are allowed and saw that there's many possible modes that could be excited. And this has to do with the overlap between the ground state and the excited state vibrational uh, modes on top of the electronic states there. When the molecule gets to an excited state, it will vibrationally relax to the vibrational ground state by emitting this energy, usually in the form of heat. It can contact other molecules and so forth. And then in most cases, the molecules will fluoresce back down to the ground state. We'll talk about this inter-system crossing event that can happen where molecules convert from the singlet state to the triplet state. And once they're in the triplet state, they must phosphoresce back to the ground state. So these solid lines are the radiative transitions, absorption, uh, fluorescence, phosphorescence, and then the squiggly lines there are non-radiative transitions. So the first thing we're going to want to talk about is to actually address what is happening when these molecules absorb light and why do we say that this uh, triplet state uh, absorption is forbidden when we clearly see that there's a uh, phosphorescence that can happen. Um, so we go back to vibrational spectroscopy and we remember what forbidden means. Uh, now forbidden really isn't so forbidden. Um, and we are often capable of seeing these forbidden transitions. Uh, so we saw the overtone transitions for vibrational spectroscopy. And so what this forbidden really means is weak or not very likely. So we have allowed transitions that are strong transitions and weak, uh, forbidden transitions that are weak transitions. We can talk about the strength of the transition using Beer's Law. And so Beer's law here uh, is that the absorbance, which is the logarithm of the transmitted light uh, that comes through versus the uh, incident light that's shown upon it, so this talked about how much light is absorbed, is equal to uh, epsilon times the path length times the concentration. So the more stuff you have, the more is absorbed. Uh, this path length is pretty standard. It's usually one centimeter. And then we have this epsilon, which is the molar extinction coefficient that talks about how well light is absorbed by the particular chromophore we're interested in. Uh, and so we can see some examples of chromophores over here. And you can see that things like uh, conjugated uh, double bonds have higher molar extinction coefficients than other things. So the larger the molar extinction coefficient, the more light is absorbed. The larger the concentration, the more light is absorbed. And there's this fundamental relationship between concentration, extinction coefficient, and then the absorption that actually happens. So we can use this to evaluate the strength of the absorption of light. This, the larger that epsilon is, the larger the molar extinction coefficient, the larger uh, the, the magnitude of light absorbed. This molar extinction coefficient is a function of wavelength because different wavelengths of light will be absorbed differently. Uh, and that's corresponding to the allowed transitions that occur. For a spin allowed transition, so going from singlet to singlet or triplet to triplet, 
Uh, so following the delta S equals zero rule, the molar extinction coefficients are typically in the range of 10 to 50,000. For these forbidden transitions, they're in the range of 10 to the minus fourth to one. So they're typically many orders of magnitude less favorable than the spin allowed transitions. And so this is the reason we call them forbidden, not because they're impossible or never happen, but because they are much, much, much less likely than the allowed transitions. So for all intents and purposes, we don't really see uh, absorption of going from the singlet state to the triplet state, assuming, of course, that the singlet state is in uh, is the ground state. So when our molecules are absorbing light, then they are essentially always obeying the delta S equals zero selection rule. So what happens then when our molecules absorb light? We saw this on the last slide. And what we're going to talk about here is the properties of fluorescence. So when a molecule absorbs light, it goes from the ground state then to the excited state, obeying the delta S equals zero selection rule. So if it starts in the singlet state, it goes to the singlet excited state. The Frank Condon principle tells us that it can go into many different vibrational states. And so we could see that here. This, uh, this green line is one example of going from the ground state to one, two, three, four, five, the fifth vibrationally excited state. And it could also go into many other vibrationally excited states. The fifth one isn't the only one that's possible. Uh, this is just one example. So what happens then is we've talked about this before, but our molecules will uh, rapidly lose energy because these vibrational relaxations going to the vibrational ground state is much more rapid than the fluorescence processes. Uh, so it'll go back down to the ground state and then it will emit light and it will emit light in the same way that it absorbed light, according to the Frank Condon principle. It can go to many of the possible uh, uh, vibrational states for the ground state. So what does this look like? It looks like a molecule starting in the vibrational uh, ground state and the electronic ground state being excited to the vibrational uh, or to many vibrational states of the electronic excited state. So we don't just see a single wavelength. We see many wavelengths, depending on how many uh, vibrational states can be accessed. Then we see vibrational relaxation all down to the vibrational ground state still of the electronic excited state. And then when it emits light, it fluoresces and it goes back down to the ground state again of any of the possible vibrational excited states for the electronic ground state. And then it will uh, lose energy back to the ground state completely. So what happens in this case? If you measure the length of these lines, which correspond to the energy, you'll see one, we have many different lengths of these lines here. And two, we have many different wavelengths of these fluorescence lines here, but the fluorescence lines are all different than the absorption lines. So we have the one case where we go from the uh, vibrational ground state to the ground state, and we can see that line is also met here when we go from ground state to ground state. But all of these other lines are shorter and all of these other lines are longer. So what does that mean for the absorption spectra and the emission spectra? Well, it means that the absorption is happening at higher energy wavelengths and the emission or the fluorescence is happening at lower energy wavelengths. So we get a shift and this shift actually ends up being a mirror image of itself. So we have the case here where in this, all these lines here are corresponding to, in this case, zero to zero, one to zero, two to zero, uh, three to zero. Um, and this is for fluorescence. And here we have for absorption at higher energy and lower frequency. So we have zero to zero, zero to one, zero to two, zero to three, zero to four. And we see this mirror image of each other. This plot is from the book. And I want to mention that typically these experiments are plotted as a function, I think more often of wavelength, at least that's how I'm used to seeing them. Um, so they're plotted as a function of wavelength rather than frequency. So the location of the absorption and the emission there is flipped because absorption is happening at a higher energy, which is lower wavelength, and fluorescence is at lower energy, which is higher wavelength. But we can see this trend. And also note here that we are ignoring the rotational energy levels. So typically, we'll look at some real data in class next time. And we'll see that we don't often see peaks. We do often see this rough mirror image trend, uh, but it tends to be broader because the rotational energy levels are in the middle of these vibrational energy levels. And we just end up getting broad peaks rather than discrete peaks talking about these uh, levels.
We'll talk about this more next time, but I want to mention that the fluorescence lifetime is on the order of 100 nanoseconds. So that's about how long molecules exist in this excited state before emitting back down to the ground state. And what this means is that fluorescence basically only happens when you are shining light on the molecules. So you shine light on molecules, uh, they fluoresce as you're shining light on them, and that's it. When the light goes away, they stop fluorescing. So there's some interesting things, and we'll look at probably some demos of this in class to kind of show us what this technique looks like. I'll mention here internal conversions. So this is a non-radiative path whereby molecules can uh, lose energy strictly through non-radiative means. So in some cases, molecules in uh, electronic excited states can be converted through a non-radiative path, such as you know colliding with other molecules or so forth, into a very high vibrationally excited state of the electronic ground state. In this case, it would decay back to the ground state without losing uh, without ever emitting a photon just by strictly losing its energy. This can also happen in the opposite direction on our chart here. And that would be called intersystem crossing, which is then followed by phosphorescence. So in this case, we are going from a singlet state to a triplet state. And we're doing this despite the fact that I told you just a few slides ago, this is something that happens with very low frequency. Again, what we have to always remember is that there are processes that happen to molecules that are non-radiative. So if these processes are non-radiative, they do not have to follow the rules for spectroscopy because they're not, uh, they're not absorbing or emitting light. So a molecule will somehow convert from a singlet state into a triplet state. How do they do that? The requirements are essentially that these molecules have similar geometries in the singlet and triplet state and a strong spin orbit coupling, which can help initiate this spin flip. So what does that mean? Here, we'll look at the ground states. This is the ground state, the s naught state that we've been talking about, the singlet state. In purple, we have the excited singlet state, and in red, we have the excited triplet state. And note, of course, that the triplet state is lower in energy than the singlet state. That's our, our definition uh, coming from Hund's rules. So the lines here are indicating our vibrational energy levels, and it's not just the energy, but it also talks about the bond length and so forth. So if we look here, we can see that at this point, there is an energy level between the singlet state and the triplet state where the vibrational energies are the same. So the total energy of the molecule is the same in the singlet state and the triplet state, that's a different sum of vibrational and electronic energy levels, but this is the same or very nearly the same. And what that means is that at this point, if we have high enough spin orbit coupling, the molecule in the singlet state can be converted because the geometry is very similar to the triplet state. And then we have a molecule in the triplet state. Now, what happens? The same thing that always happens when we have a molecule in an excited state is it rapidly loses its energy through vibrational relaxation and ends in the triplet ground state. In the triplet state ground state, it can't do anything else. It can't go back to the excited singlet state. It's just stuck there. Um, and so we have this molecule that now has absorbed light and it's stuck in this triplet state. It can't uh, fluoresce back down to the ground state. And what does it do? It has to go by these forbidden processes. And the name for this process is phosphorescence. So it has to phosphoresce to go back to the ground state. And since this is forbidden, it has a low molar extinction coefficient, and it takes a while for this to happen. So the fluorescence lifetime was up in the order of magnitude of, of nanoseconds, hundreds of nanoseconds. The lifetime for these phosphorescence processes can be as fast as a millisecond, but it can also be up to hours. So it can be hours long to decay, to lose this energy. Uh, and so what this means is that we have a delay. We have a, a physical delay in the, the emission of light, and these can continue to emit light uh, for long times, even after the light source goes away. Um, and this one example of this is, of course, glow-in-the-dark 
pigments. So how do things glow in the dark? Well, they absorb light when the light is on and then they emit light when the light is off. So things like glow in the dark stars that you may have had up in your room as a child, um, these are inherently phosphorescent. They are emitting light continually even after the light source is gone because they can hold light for uh, minutes and hours in this excited state. In the last part of class here, I want to go over a few examples of how these kinds of techniques have been used. One really important example for especially the study of biochemistry is using fluorescent spectroscopy to sequence the human genome. So the way that this technique works, and you probably have heard about this in biochemistry, um, first, DNA is broken apart into certain length pieces, typically the order of, of thousands, one to two thousand base pairs. And then this DNA is amplified with a small fraction of fluorescent uh, DDNTP. So by DDNTP here, I mean dideoxynucleotide triphosphates. Now, what are these guys? So here we have a typical uh, nucleotide triphosphate. This is a, a DATP, it's deoxy here. It's a, it's a nucleotide, uh, it's, it's a DNA, not an RNA, because uh, it's a deoxynucleotide. Here we have a DDATP uh, that's fluorescently labeled. So we have a dideoxy, we have taken this second hydroxyl off uh, and we attach this very large uh, polar thing here. Now this molecule also happens to be yellow. It's fluorescent and it fluoresces yellow. So what happens when you add this guy into the DNA synthesis reaction is you can add this on. So it has this adenosine, it has a triphosphate, so it can get added on. But the site at which molecules add, or the DNA polymerase adds the next base is this hydroxyl. So the fact that these are dideoxynucleotides, I mean, they don't have this hydroxyl and they prevent further uh, DNA synthesis. So what happens when we add these molecules into our DNA synthesis? Well, the DNA polymerase will polymerize, it'll make DNA. Um, and since we have a small amount of these fluorescent DDNTPs, that means most of the time when the, the DNA polymerase is supposed to add an A, it's gonna add a normal ATP. But sometimes when it needs to add an A, it's gonna add this thing. And then that will halt polymerization. So we'll end up with uh, DNA that is truncated at a certain amount of, of DNA length that corresponds to when it incorporated this funky A residue. We can do this for all of the nucleotides in tandem. Now we don't want to label them with yellow, but we can label them with different colors. So each nucleotide gets its own different color. And what this gives us it then is DNA, and that DNA is of various lengths and each DNA is truncated, it's stopped with a nucleotide with a different color that corresponds whether it's an A, a T, a G, or a C. Then with the technique of capillary electrophoresis, which is a very, very small capillary with a very small diameter, so you can get very good separation based on charge. And of course, charge in the DNA is dependent on the length since each uh, component of DNA adds one charge. If you have a, a 10 base pair long DNA, you have minus 10 charge. If you have 100, you have minus 100 charge. So you can separate this based on charge in the capillary. And what will come through at the end of the DNA sequencing is molecules coming through with certain amounts of charge, meaning certain amounts of length, and they'll all have the same color depending on the terminal base. And so what we can get is a direct readout of what colors we are getting. Um, and we can see this technique, and if you can go and you can read yellow, yellow, blue, green, red, and maybe that means A, A, C, uh, T, G. And you can get out a reading of what the, the DNA is. Uh, this technique was vital in the original Human Genome Project. It's still probably the most common source of, of DNA sequencing that's done today, especially if you just want to say sequence a gene in a plasmid. Uh, this is what's done today. If people want to sequence whole organisms, there's, a, there's more advanced techniques that they use um, that still kind of do the same thing. Um, but it's, it's a, this part is what is really changing here, the breaking apart to get a picture of the whole genome. 
Uh, but this is an adaptation of Sanger sequencing, and you may have talked about this in biochemistry, or you may have just talked about the original Sanger sequencing. This essentially removes the need for multiple experiments. It allows you to do it all at the same time, and no horrible long DNA gels. You can just uh, get a whole picture of what your, of your what your genome is. And this is typically accurate. It depends on the, the person doing it. So sometimes you have undergrad students doing it and they're not as good, but professionals are better. And you can typically get reads on the order of a thousand base pairs. So you can sequence about a thousand base pairs uh, with this technique fairly accurately, again, depending on the hands of the person who does the technique. Uh, this technique is also interesting because it can be accurate. It can detect on the order of like 100 molecules. Uh, is what it takes to detect the fluorescent signal. So it's a pretty uh, a powerful technique there. Another interesting technique is called ultraviolet photoelectron spectroscopy. This is another very similar application based on the photoelectric effect. Essentially, different wavelengths of light are shown on two molecules. And depending on the wavelength of light, you're going to hit a different electron and give that electron enough light to be ejected. So in this case, they're shining lower energy red light, and that light is only capable of ionizing these highest energy levels. And then they'll be ionized with a certain amount of kinetic energy. If you shine higher energy blue light, that's also capable of exciting molecules, but now it's gonna excite these lower level ones. Uh, again, and that's gonna emit them and cause them to have a certain amount of kinetic energy. And so what you can get with this kind of technique is a plot that looks like this where you have different ionization energies depending on the, the wavelength of the light shown. There's a correction you can account for. Um, the assumptions that go into this are first that the, the vibration doesn't change as a function of ionization. That's pretty good that goes along with our Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Uh, and there's another approximation that's called the frozen orbital approximation. That means the orbitals don't change as a function of being ionized. So assuming both of those two uh, things, which are approximately true, what we get is then a direct measurement based on the kinetic energy. So we have a certain amount of input energy. We have uh, an electron that has a certain amount of emitted kinetic energy. The difference there being the energy that it had, that it had to overcome when it was being ionized. And so this allows us to experimentally measure ionization energy, which gives us a experimental comparison for what we would predict for the energy of molecular orbitals. And so these black lines here are the predicted molecular orbitals uh, for this molecule here. Here we can see what they are. And you can note that the experimental measurement is pretty good, sort of a pretty good comparison. And note that the problem here is more likely to lie with the assumptions we're making in the experimental model rather than with the computational model. So this shows us that our computational energy levels are doing a pretty good job at describing the energy levels that these electrons have in their orbitals. And so with that, I'll, I'll leave it here and we'll go into some more detail about some more kinds of techniques next time, specifically talking about applications to biomolecules. So I'm looking forward to talking with you about this more in class.